Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar on the Chalk Stream Restoration Strategy. If you're joining us for the first time, these, the seminar series one runs weekly on Thursdays at 1 till 2, uh, featuring a new guest speaker each week. And currently we have the, the GW4 uh, PhD students from the GW4 Fresh CDT sharing the session this semester. If you want to view and catch up on any previous webinars, you can do so using this uh, link on the uh, Water Security Alliance website. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Tom O'Herman. I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Bath and uh, a member of the GW4 Fresh CDT as well. And I'm particularly interested in this talk today on chalk streams because my PhD is focused on the River Froome in Dorset, uh, modelling both emerging contaminants and, and gross pollutants. So River Froome being the, uh, one of the most westerly chalk streams of the UK, or, or is the most westerly chalk stream of the UK. Uh, as we all know, chalk streams can be havens for biodiversity, but like a lot of our rivers, uh, suffer from a multitude of, of anthropogenic stresses. So today, um, it's my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker, which is Charles Rangeley Wilson, uh, who's going to be giving us a whistle-stop tour of some of the issues that uh, chalk streams face and um, the action plan required to restore them to optimal health. Uh, Charles has had an interest in, in river restoration, particularly chalk rivers, since the early 90s. Uh, in 1997, he founded the Wild Trout Society, which later became the Wild Trout Trust. He also co-founded Norfolk Rivers Trust uh, and is vice president of the Wild Foundation, to name just a, a few highlights. And... Uh, most recently, uh, Charles is, has been chairing the, the Chalk Stream Restoration Group and uh, authored the, the Restoration Strategy Report, which uh, in a minute I'll put a link to in the chat. Um, and also I encourage you throughout this, this talk to uh, use the chat to ask any questions, which hopefully we'll have some time to go through at the end in, in the last 10 to 15 minutes. So without further ado, I'll now hand you over to Charles. Charles, over to you. Stop sharing. Hi there. Um, hi there, everybody. Um, uh, may I suggest uh, you all hit your, your turn your mic to mute. Um, someone was unscrewing the lid of a coffee jar just then, a particularly high volume. Um, so that would uh, that be brilliant. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Um, great to meet you all. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the Chalk Stream Restoration Strategy, and I'm just going to try and share my screen. <clears throat> um, there we go. OK. Um, so a uh, little bit of background about me. Well, you've just heard that um, I, I've sort of been interested in river conservation for many, many years, um, set up the Wild Trout Trust and the Norfolk Rivers Trust. I've also done quite a lot of work with uh, WWF on campaigning, um, rivers on the edge, um, flushed away various uh, UK freshwater chalk stream based campaigns. Um, and over the last 10 years or so, I've been doing a uh, or running a, a catchment wide restoration project on the River Nar in Norfolk, which is uh, in, on your screens there at the moment. That's a, a, a restored reach of the river, which we did a few years ago. Um, and I was asked by, about 18 months ago, I was asked by Sarah Powell at the Environment Agency and Mark Lloyd, um, Director of the Rivers Trust, if I would help chair a CABA, which stands for Catchment Based Approach Working Group, called the Chalk Streams, which we call the Chalk Streams Restoration Group. Um, so for, what is the strategy? Well, it's a, it's a sort of shared uh, vision and goals and a plan, how we'll realize those goals for how to restore good ecological health to the unique rivers we call Chalk Streams, and the landscapes which support them. There have been a number of strategies and uh, charters and so on for chalk streams over the years. Where this one is um, uh, hopefully different is that it has um, necessity has meant, you know, with the CABA space, it's a collaborative space involving all the stakeholders. So that's a really key difference. Um, so 
uh, I'll just on the next screen um, talk to you a little bit about who, who was involved. So the main CAVA panel involved representation from the Environment Agency, from DEFRA, from Natural England and Ofwat. So these were the regulators, but also the main NGOs. So WWF, the Angling Trust, the Wildlife Trusts, the Rivers Trust, Salmon and Trout Conservation, the Wild Trout Trust and the Beaver Trust. And then uh, representation from industry in the, in the water industry, um, Thames Water and Affinity and Wessex um, were uh, regular seats on the panel, but also we had specific meetings with all the water companies. And Jake Fines um, uh, represented the uh, NFU. But I also put together a, an expert panel to grind through some of the sort of technically difficult issues. Um, and that was again, very sort of academically uh, broad church. Um, Chris Mainster from Natural England, David Sear, Kate Heppel, Steve Brooks, these are all people who know an awful lot about chalk streams and how they work um, through to uh, um, uh, Jonathan Fisher, for example, an environmental economist, John Lawson, a water and engineering consultant. So a, a very wide range of expertise there. We met uh, quite a few times. And in addition, there was a wider stakeholder group, which was essentially open to all. So everyone who has an interest in chalk streams was invited to partake in um, the consultation after the first draft. And actually that consultation process did lead to quite a few additions um, and uh, 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 sort of uh, changes to the report. So I, I like to think that it was a very democratic um, and inclusive attempt to try to pin down what we could do to make these rivers better. But I was also very keen myself to bring um, pragmatism and um, uh, you know, practicality that when we set up the Wild Trout Trust, the whole idea was it was about getting your feet wet, like getting out there into the landscape and doing work. Um, I'm conscious that these reports can gather dust um, and uh, I, I'm hoping this one will be different because I'm hoping that it is uh, pragmatic and deliverable, even if that means to a degree um, uh, meeting, you know, the sort of classic British compromise and meeting in the middle um, on certain issues um, or on certain actions anyway. But, but we did get a really good accord and everyone was, everyone actually was really positive um, right across the board um, and really proactive. Anyway, why are you, I mean, I didn't know everything about, you know, I don't know much about my audience today. Often when I'm talking, I know I'm talking to uh, a, a group of people who are definitively, um, you know, very, very passionate about ch chalk streams. That might not be the case today, although I gather you're all sort of academically involved in the freshwater environment. But what, why do chalk streams need this strategy over any, any other river um, and why are they garnering such attention? Well, essentially they're, they're globally unique. They're a spring fed river. They're like limestone fed rivers. Chalk is a form of limestone, but you only really get this massive outcrop of chalk at the surface um, in uh, England mostly, but also in Normandy and, and to a degree in Denmark. There's chalk in other parts of the world, but chalk in those parts of the world um, doesn't really um, exist in the sort of in, in the same geological arrangement that gives birth to the rivers. So they're, they're globally very special rivers. They're not unique to England, but they're unique to our corner of Europe and most of the chalk streams that exist are English. They're ecologically very rich rivers. They're the most biodiverse of all English rivers, a vast habit, the range of habitats for different invertebrates, fish, birds, mammals. In Wessex on the Froome where Tomo's working, um, chalk streams are the last strong, stronghold of our chalk stream Atlantic salmon, which recent research, research has shown to be genetically distinct. So the salmon that swim the Froome are, are very different genetically from the salmon that swim the Axe, which is the neighboring river. And they are much more closely related probably to the salmon that swim some of the, uh, the Normandy chalk streams, for example. Um, and there are all sorts of geological reasons for that, which I could go into um, fascinating stuff, but that's another story. Um, and the chalk streams are under intense pressure because they flow through a very, very busy um, uh, landscape, Southeast England, um, where there's an immense pressure on, uh, on them in all sorts of ways. They've been very highly modified. There's pressure on water resources. There's pressure on, um, on, uh, in terms of pollution. So how do we structure this strategy? Um, well, I was keen to um, look at the whole idea of because it all comes down to money when it comes to restoring the natural environment. 
And uh, best value is often looked at. And um, any proposed project or pitch to a sort of funding stream, I know this very well, is subjected to sort of cost benefit analysis in one form or another. And one thing I've learned restoring rivers is that you really achieve cost benefit by, um, by addressing all of the components that are limiting the ecological health of the stream, not just one of them. Um, so I, was, I sort of drew up this triangle and in fact, David Sear helped me with that. In fact, we, in fact, we independently came to more or less the same thing, um, which is this sort of ecological uh, trinity in a way where you have natural flow, clean water, and natural habitat and you can see the plus arrows show how you sort of um, bio magnify it in a way so improvements in one um, can can lead to improvements in the other elements and improvements all in all three lead to the greatest possible improvement uh, in the terms of overall ecology whereas if you only improve one without improving the other two let's say you restore natural flows but to a heavily impounded and still polluted river well, you will only see a very modest ecological benefit from that um, intervention. And so um, I, I was keen that the strategy would um, readdress the whole idea of what we actually mean by best value and, um, and best value analysis. So just going to taking them one at a time, then um, we have restoring flow. Uh, so chalk streams, as you uh, as you may know, um, uh, flow from underground um, bodies of water called aquifers um, and uh, these aquifers were well they were identified hundreds of years ago as sources of useful water but really in the post-war years and the and the sort of growth of the new towns especially around London and in the home counties the chalk aquifers were became an immensely uh, useful resource for very very clean and what was thought to be almost limitless supply of water for public consumption. And groundwater abstraction of the chalk streams in London's orbit um, and a, a few elsewhere, but it ballooned in the post-war years, um, climbing to a peak in the mid 1980s, where in some catchments, those little rivers on the right, for example, um, over half the water available to the river and consequently in dry years, all of the water available to the river was taken in groundwater abstraction and consequently the rivers dried up. That reached a crisis point in the sort of drought years of 89 to 92. And in 1991, the then National Rivers Authority um, launched a program called Alleviation of Low Flows. And they identified something like 40, 50 rivers nationally of which 15 were chalk streams, which were suffering from acute low flows as a result of abstraction. And those rivers are in that little box there. Um, some 30 years later, only the river names in green um, currently um, pass the Water Framework Directive for flow, flow being a supporting element. So uh, they're deemed where the flow supports good ecological status. Those rivers in red all still fail their ecological status. And across the chalk streams more generally, 75 chalk streams are currently assessed as do not support good ecological status for flow. So there's intense pressure on the chalk streams, but that pressure is not evenly distributed. And that was another thing I was very keen to address is to actually give people an idea of what the spatial um, and um, uh, uh, the degree, so the spatial um, distribution of that pressure and the degree of that pressure, because the Water Framework Directive, as it stands now, if you were to look up uh, any given river, you would see that it either does or does not support flow. Um, good ecological status for flow and it's a binary assessment which isn't really much use when you're trying to strategize where to um, put your resources so um, I commissioned a survey from John Lawson which was an abstraction as a percentage of recharge it's one way of assessing the pressure of abstraction there are other ways this is a very simple way because it's very easy to get your head around it's what proportion of the water in the aquifer that, that, sorry, it's what proportion of the effective rainfall that gets into the aquifer, so the effective recharge of the catchment, gets taken in groundwater abstraction. And as you can see, it's a very, very varied picture. So the River Froome, for example, which Tom mentioned, really quite a low abstraction as a percentage of recharge figure across the whole catchment, so only 2%, whereas the CERN, which is a tributary of the Froome, it's actually way too high at 15 16%. Um, but you can see there 
just from the colours where the really acute pressure is. It's around London and into Kent and to a degree up into Cambridgeshire as well with a couple of very heavily abstracted rivers, especially the Upper Cam and the Lark. But the real pressure, unsurprisingly, is where the population is greatest. A lot of the Wessex rivers, they're not doing too badly. Although, of course, it's worth remembering the Wessex rivers have a higher designation, or many of them do. Um, the, the Avon catchment is SAC, the Test is a triple SI, the Itchin is an SAC, and they have a higher standard. We came up with a figure for this, which is that for a river to really get any chance of getting close to meeting the uh, water framework directive status for flow, the groundwater abstraction really ought to be 10% or less from that catchment. Obviously, there are subtle nuances catchment by caption, but that's a, a, a broad brush sort of idea. So that's what the same thing looks like in a different form. I prepared a talk last week and I thought I'd, some of these slides I'd use again because I was talking to the Chiltern Society about the particular pressures of the Colne system. So the Colne is a chalk stream um, that flows around the west of London into the Thames. So it picks up the tributaries that flow out of the Chiltern Hills there. So they are among the more heavily pressured chalk streams because where they are um, uh, flowing through Amersham, Chesham, Rickmansworth, um, these, so these sorts of towns, um, very, very heavily pop populated part of the world, very, very high per capita water consumption. So you can see there that the Ver, for example, has um, abstraction uh, as a percentage of recharge of over 30%. Um, the Gade and the Bullbourne um, of over 50%. So really quite significant abstraction pressure. And if we zoom in here on the Chilterns, because we're going to get to a proposal, for example, you can see um, uh, the idea that we've identified the idea that um, a, a definition of sustainable abstraction, which everyone has now signed up to, and a target to be aimed for, even if it takes, you know, 20 odd years, that um, we will achieve sustainable abstraction in the chalk streams where flows are reduced by no more than 10%. The abstraction as percentage of recharge is one way of assessing it. There are other ways. Um, the deficits on the Colne, for example, to get back to that, add up to sort of 10 megalitres a day on the Misborn, 10 on the Chest, 6 on the Bullborn, 10 on the Gade, 20 on the Ver. So you've got a 56 megalitre a day deficit on the Colne system to return it back to that sort of sustainable flow standard. Um, and uh, so how do we do that? How do we make scenes like this is the River Bean, which is a Lee chalk stream where I've been taking photographs from the same bridge for a number of years, not flowing in 2009, not flowing in 2017. How do we make scenes like these one in 100 or one in 500 year events instead of the one in 10 uh, actually, people who live on the beam would say more often than that, one in 10 year events that we are suffering because of heavy, heavy groundwater abstraction. How do we restore natural flows to chalk streams within our lifetimes? Because we can't just turn off the pumps. Um, people will run out of water. We need to develop the infrastructure and the means to do this. How do we restore those natural flows without threatening the resilience of public water supplies? In the Chilterns and Hertfordshire, there's an idea which I've been promoting, um, which I think uh, would allow us to do a national flagship flow recovery project to realign the point of abstraction from the chalk aquifer in the headwaters to the surface water in the lower river, basically redesigning it to the way in which we would exploit this natural resource. If we had a clean sheet of paper and we were starting from scratch. And I've called that proposal Chalk Streams First because it would allow the water to flow down the river before we use it. It's basically very simple. It's, uh, it, takes a, it makes use of the way chalk streams work. So the aquifer is, would remain a reservoir, rather like, for example, the proposed reservoir at Abingdon would require the River Thames as a means of delivery. Um, and I know of, of systems in New Zealand, for example, where the rivers are used as a conduit from the storage to the place of use. Um, the chalk aquifer would still remain a effectively, in terms of public water supply terms, uh, a reservoir, but you would allow it to refill um, by turning off the groundwater abstraction in the headwaters, which would boost river flow um, up to about 80% of the water that you don't abstract would be 
um, would manifest as surface flows across the full flow duration curve. I ought to point out that you get over 100% return during the winter, but as low as 20 or even 10% return on that abstracted water in the summer. But across the full year, perhaps as much as 80% of the water you don't abstract in the headwaters um, is available as surface flow and flows down the river where it could be captured and stored in the London storage reservoirs and then recirculated with a pipeline that is in Affinity Waters business plan already, a pipeline called Supply 2040. This is probably really teaching grandmother to suck eggs if I'm talking to a room full of academics um, who, who know all about water, but this is the way I try to show what um, how an aquifer works in terms of chalk stream flows. It's my bucket aquifer analogy. So in the bucket on the left, you have uh, a, a, an aquifer in equilibrium, essentially. The rainwater is coming through the hose. Um, the bucket is the aquifer and the river is the holes up the side of the bucket. And you can see that hydrostatic pressure drives the water out of the holes. So the lowest hole, the water is squirting much further than it does in the highest hole. Add a form of discharge, for example, take out that cork at the bottom of the bucket and the water level in the bucket must fall. It will have to, because if it didn't, then the same amount of water would carry on going out of the holes on the left and you'd need additional cheap recharge to make up the difference. So the water level in the bucket must fall and fall it does until it reaches a new state of equilibrium um, where some of the recharge is going in a new direction. We'll call that new direction abstraction. So with flow recovery, you simply reverse that process. You put the hole back in the, the cork back in the bucket, the groundwater level will then go back up again, flow will, will resume to a natural level and then you harvest it further down the system. And that is the chalk stream's first idea. Now, since we've mooted it, so that's, that's it in diagrammatic form in the Chiltern. So you reduce all of those lovely chalk streams to a sustainable flow level, allow the water to flow down the column, take it out of the lower Thames instead, use the storage reservoirs and the pipeline to basically redesign abstraction to the sort of system we might um, think about if we were just starting again. Um, since mooting that as an idea, um, I've heard um, that uh, it's being investigated in similar terms for some other chalk stream systems like the CAM and the Great Stour. So that's very exciting because one of the reasons why I'm really keen to see this happen on a regional scale in, in the Chilterns is that I think a national flagship to show how this would work could then manifest itself across um, all of our chalk streams where they are heavily abstracted. And of course, the brilliant thing about it is that you don't lose all of that water to public water supply. Um, the net loss is perhaps um, quite, a, quite considerably less than 100%. Um, and uh, so you're not necessarily looking, although there's some obviously some investment in the infrastructure, you're not necessarily looking to replace all of those megalitres of water. By the way, a megalitre a day is worth about two or three million pounds to a water company in their annual um, uh, business. Um, so uh, we, at the end of each of the sections, whether it's water quantity, so that's a very Cook's tour of flow, we have a number of recommendations for action in the strategy, um, and they're in a table like this. So in terms of the water quantity and flow, we first of all got everyone to agree on what we actually meant by sustainable abstraction. Um, we're looking at various sort of detail things like the, the way in which rivers are banded, which doesn't quite make sense. We're looking at an enhanced scenario in the National Framework for Water Resources, essentially prioritizing chalk stream abstraction reduction. We're looking at realigning some of the assessment points because you have these slight um, uh, with, with, with flow assessment. If the assessment point is downstream of a discharge like a sewage works, you might well assess that the river supports good ecological status for flow when it's um, dry in the headwaters and most of the flow is sewage discharge, as is the case, for example, on the upper River Lee, which is a uh, London chalk stream. So a series of recommendations like that, and I'm gonna have to crack on. So I'll move on to reducing pollution. This has been much in the news lately, um, uh, particularly in terms of sewage, raw sewage discharges, but pollution comes in, in several, um, well, many shapes and forms, um, but really reducing it to the simplest forms, um, we have nutrients, excess nutrients from sewage and largely agricultural activity. Um, 
you have sediments from farm and road runoff and to those uh, sediments are attached all sorts of pollutants, including nutrients, but others as well. Um, and then chemicals from roads. Um, you've got a nice purple chalk stream there. Ironically, when we launched this strategy, we chose the rather lovely River Mimram in Hertfordshire um, and launched the strategy on Friday, October the 15th last year. And on M Monday, the, um, the 18th, the river turned purple. Um, uh, the, uh, it didn't actually kill any fish. Um, the Environment Agency investigated. I think someone poured a can of purple paint off a bridge. But um, it was used by some to suggest that that the uh, the strategy was was going nowhere. I actually felt that it underlined the importance of the strategy um, because one of the things you're tackling really, um, and I think it's changing, is how society looks at rivers. Um, do we see them as drains or do we see them as vibrant ecological ecosystems that it should be our duty to look after? Um, so uh, chalk streams are naturally very low in nutrients and carry very few sediments. They're immensely stable rivers. They hardly move once they're, once they're sort of fully established, unlike sort of high energy rivers of um, the sort of more upland um, or flashy runoff systems. Uh, chalk stream sediment, sediment in a natural system, um, really very little sediment gets into a chalk stream. Um, now, again, I probably don't need to go through some of the subtleties of this um, It's for a more, more general audience, but you'll all know how nutrients affect the ecosystem in a river. And as nutrients rise, um, you, the, they start to favor a different range of plants, um, basically simplifying the plant uh, system in the river to the point where if the nutrients rise very, very high, you basically get a kind of monoculture of different forms of algae. Um, and the algae will use up um, the oxygen in the water. It will swamp the river, the river gravels, um, and it will swamp the leaves of the other plants. Um, so when nutrient concentration gets terribly elevated and you end up with the eutrophic system, as you do with some chalk streams, then really you've got a massive crash in biodiversity. The oxygen demand goes up and all of the life in the river suffers. Bringing those nutrient levels back down again, um, because it's been a death by a thousand cuts, it needs to be restoration by a thousand rest restorations. Um, I really think incremental improvements are very much worthwhile. Um, there has been, you know, people have made the point that, um, you know, any one measure, for example, an integrated wetland below a um, secondary only sewage treatment works won't bring nutrient levels back below the trigger point and therefore it's not worth doing but I passionately believe that you've got to do these things cumulatively and everything that you can do to get those nutrient levels back down gets you a tiny bit closer to the point where you will start to see some ecological gain. And that photograph, for example, is the River Nar. That's a bit of river where I moved the river. Actually, that's a brand new channel. It was a meadow until three years ago. Um, and that's the river back where it used to be in the middle of the floodplain. Um, but interestingly, um, just a couple of years before we did that project, the sewage works at the village upstream was upgraded um, and uh, in fact was taken, um, the sewage uh, is no longer goes into the river there. And those gravels remained bright um, throughout the winter, whereas formerly there'd been, would have been benthic al algae on those gravels. So um, it just shows that these cumulative uh, impacts can make a difference. So um, here's another very interesting chart. Again, uh, this is a chalk stream in the um, in the uh, Chilterns, this is the uh, uh, Misbourne. Um, now this is to do with source apportionment. Um, uh, we're reading a lot in the news about the sort of uh, uh, sources of pollution in rivers at the moment and agriculture is a major source of pollution. Um, but I wanted to um, show the relative scale of the issue in terms of, of nutrients on a chalk stream. Chalk streams are subtly different rivers from your rain-fed upland rivers with a high runoff factor. Chalk streams are to a degree protected from runoff by their highly absorbent catchments and by the fact that the chalk mitigates phosphorus if in the groundwater. Um, so in a chalk stream, I believe that the sewage works is the obvious place to uh, target investment 
um, because the sewage works are providing bioavailable um, nutrients 365 days a year, um, and that concentration goes up as flows diminish. And you can see in that chart on the River Misborn, the very, very low lying blue line at the bottom of the chart, which you can barely see, is the phosphorus levels upstream of the sewage works. And you can see that it rises, that blue line rises through the winter rainfall period, suggesting that it's going up as a result in direct response to rainfall as the flows in the rivers increase. So that would be a tracer, I think, for your phosphorus coming in in terms of the diffuse pollution off the wider landscape. The red line is below the sewage works. And as you can see, that climbs to a peak before the winter rainfall and then falls through the winter rainfall. So that is that is phosphorus level that is being diluted by flow and is increasing in concentration as a result of diminishing flows. Um, and you can see in terms of the scale of the issue that the sewage works is uh, multiple times more significant loading of phosphorus than the, the landscape. That's not the case in every chalk stream, of course. It depends, every little river is different. And um, Tommo is studying the Froome, um, is studying uh, an upper green sand uh, chalk stream or a mixed geology chalk stream, which tends to start life with much higher phosphorus levels because the green sand does not mitigate the phosphorus in the groundwater to anything like the degree that chalk does. Now, this one, uh, this chart's a fascinating chart from Kate, he Kate Heppel at Queen Mary University, who's been doing some work on the river chest. So this shows the dissolved oxygen in the river chest above and below the Chesham sewage treatment works outfall. And what you can see there is generally much higher oxygen demand downstream, the red line, um, than upstream. So that shows a general impact of the sewage works. You can also the, see the spikes at A and B. Those are raw sewage discharges. So that's when um, the, uh, the oxygen really, you know, the, you get a sudden spike from the, the, the discharges that are in the news at the moment, basically, and the impact you can see but on the right, um, where, where you see that sort of the, the area C, that is the impact from groundwater ingress. So that's when the sewage works is, is spilling or overflowing all the time because the uh, pipe system is getting overwhelmed by groundwater, which is overwhelming the ability of the sewage treatment work to treat the flow that is arriving. And therefore the sewage treatment work is um, is spilling that water effectively diluted raw sewage into the river now that's been seen as the industry by the industry you know degree as perhaps not much of an issue but i think this chart shows that it is an issue that it causes quite a cumul cumulative and significant impact on the, the um, dissolved oxygen in the water um, going forward a few other sort of interesting things to come out of the water quality side of um one of the big asks in this strategy is that chalk streams um, receive a higher uh, form of designation or protection. They are actually a priority habitat, but that priority habitat is quite a weak driver when it comes to investment. And so these charts, I drew them up to sort of show what happens as a result of whether the river is designated or not. So if it's a triple SI or an SAC, it will tend the 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 barriers for cost benefit analysis with regards to say investment in sewage treatment works tend to be a lot lower. So the burden of proof is a lot lower. And in an SAC, basically they are more or less 100%, just under 90% of the sewage treatment works on the SAC rivers have tertiary treatment sewage works. But that drops to, this is the, this is the graph on the right there, only 18% of sewage treatment works on most other chalk streams have phosphorus stripping. Um, and in fact, as I said earlier, phosphorus stripping tends to favour the larger sewage treatment works, which tend to be quite a lot further downstream in any given catchment. So to, there's a way in which the cost benefit process at the moment is a little bit skewed when it comes to the ecology of a river, because there ought to be a way of quantifying the linear length of river benefited by the phosphorus treatment, not just a sort of, not just a a metric that, that attributes a cost benefit per head of population, um, but per kilometer length, and maybe even a way of favoring the very upper reaches and the ecologically very precious reaches of a river to a very large degree. At the moment, you've got a situation where on, on literally hundreds of chalk streams, um, uh, you have sewage treatment works in the headwaters 
that do not have tertiary treatment. And so these rivers are starting off life. Um, when I say literally hundreds, it's not actually, it is, it is, it is in the hundreds. So um, the, the charts there on the, on the left show you that where chalk streams are moderate, poor or bad status for phosphate, you know, up to 80% um, uh, of them have secondary sewage treatment works and storm overflows um, uh, issues. Whereas when they're at high status for phosphate, i.e. very low concentrations, it's 77% of them either have no sewage treatment works um, or the treatment works that they do have is a uh, treats to tertiary standard. So a big difference there, all down to the way in which we assess cost benefit. But we mustn't forget farming. And um, I was very keen, I've, I've worked a lot with farmers and river restoration, um, and I know a lot of farmers and I know the pressures they're under um, and uh, the ways in which, because we've done studies on the River Nar, the ways in which farming can um, make a difference in terms of the sediment loading in rivers. And um, it is actually down to a number of really quite sort of prosaic little things. So for example, gateways, where gateways are sited, as you can see in the picture on the right, you just need the plough to go in the wrong direction and then a hole in the hedge and you have an enormous supply of sediment runoff um, to go into a river, which is often helpfully um, aided on its journey by the way in which the Highways Authority cut road grips by all the bridges to spill that stuff straight into our waterways. So we devised a number of very simple uh, farming rules for chalk streams, which we've put to DEFRA, which would include very generous buffer strips, not one meter, 10 meters, for the destructive forms of agriculture, particularly open air pigs, and uh, root crops, parsnips, carrots, and so on, where you get a lot of, of churn and disturbance to the ground. No lifting of crops after the end of October. Those lovely soil, um, soily carrots that you buy from Waitrose in January, where the supermarkets insist that there's still a bit of soil on them so that they look really organic and wholesome. Well, they've been taken out of the ground far too late in the year if they've still got soil on them in January. There should be no lifting of crops after the end of October. Gates on the uphill edges of fields. Why gates are always at the bottom of fields, I don't know, but they always are. If they were just at the top, it would make a huge difference turning the plough across the downhill corners. Really easy and effective measures that would make a humongous difference to the health of our rivers. And then I think also there's room for some incentives. The rules on the left should be compulsory and they should be policed. And then room for incentives, for example, zero till, till green swale, settlement ponds, restoration of hedges, especially those that run perpendicular to the slope. So again, we had a number of recommendations which have gone to various departments um, in relation to water uh, quality, um, farming rules for chalk streams, farming incentives, um, research into septic tank hotspots, um, and uh, looking again at the cost benefit analysis when it comes to the treatment of sewage works and the use of integrated constructed wetlands. And I've sort of more or less run out of time. Um, maybe we'll do this in the questions. It's the bit I specialize in, which is actually restoring the rivers physically. And the real thing I wanted the strategy to emphasize here, the, the chalk streams are much modified systems. So this picture of, by Constable shows you in a little vignette of the many, many ways in which chalk streams have been modified over the centuries um, with uh, impoundments to drive mills, um, navigation with pound locks um, where the river was perhaps sometimes reserved as the sort of flood relief overflow channel which is so the natural river is the one to the right there and the one on the left is the impounded river but over time the natural river has of, often been lost and many of our chalk streams now are just um, are essentially the staircase the old milling staircase at the side of the floodplain and they don't have their natural gradient um, the point with the chalk stream is they're very, very low energy. They cannot self repair. Once you've put them in some sort of modified prison, they will not break out of it. Unlike the River Tay, which if you did anything to the River Tay that the River Tay didn't much like, the River Tay would blow it out of the way the following winter. Whereas the chalk stream never can do that because they are such low energy rivers. So the philosophy behind the restoration section is that restoration should not be about imposing another modified sort of river gardening state, which is so often what I see on uh, Instagram, um, where the, the golf course management of rivers, 
river restoration should be about restoring the the riverine processes and whatever it takes to let that river out of its straitjacket. And, and I know through practical experience that is mostly about restoring the gradient, removing impoundments. It's about restoring an intact gravel bed. Most of our chalk streams have been heavily dredged and they've got no chance of replacing that riverbed this side of an ice age, so we need to do it for them. It's about restoring a dynamic interaction with trees and stop tidying our rivers. We tidy them up far too much. And all of the above about reuniting the river with the floodplain and restoring hydrological connectivity. Um, so I'll just very, very quickly give you a little, this is the project I've been doing the last couple of years, a river that has been diverted uh, to the north and then the south of the floodplain, not through the middle, uh, basically as part of a milling operation, which would have been probably back, back in the doomsday era initially. Um, we designed a project that basically put the river back where it used to be flowing through the middle of the floodplain, cutting it with diggers. It all looks a little bit sort of uh, uniform in that uh, aerial photograph there, but very quickly it softens. And so you end up with that kind of transformation. The old floodplain minus its river um, in August, 2019, and with the river back where it used to be in August, 2021. Here we restored gravels. Um, so you can see in the picture on the left, a heavily dredged chalk stream, which basically turns into a burried monoculture because burried loves silty um, bed with all the gradient lost in one section up by the bridge there and then thereafter a canal. So we restored the gravel by digging borrow pits in the floodplain, built the riverbed back up to the pre-dredging level. And you can see in the photograph on the right how you then get ranunculus back because ranunculus likes fast flows and fast flows need gradient. And finally, how you can create a spring-fed paradise just by letting the trees fall in, or in the case of this project where we actually encouraged a bit of tree falling in, um, and then you just allow the river to dynamically interact with the trees and the daylight and it will do the rest of the work for you. Um, and that's the end, so thank you. There's a link at the bottom there to the strategy and a website where I post lots of information about chalk streams and the one big wish, which really sums up the whole thing, which is let's have statutory protection that would allow us to take the brakes off investment in abstraction reduction, sewage treatment and physical habitat restoration of our chalk streams. Thank you very much.